one of the subjects that interests most people is uh, what happens after death. Everybody is prepared to accept the fact that death is uh, universal. It's kind of the end result of the human condition as we know it on Earth. And uh, there have been different theories as to what happens after death. In actual fact, uh, we don't have much information about this. In, in most of the world religions, they, they, uh, they have something to say. But uh, all the uh, responses have, a, have an essential uh, inadequacy because nobody knows what it's like until it's happened and then it's too late <laughs> to tell everybody what it's like. And if you did, they wouldn't understand it either. So what is it like to live another life without a brain? Uh, in other words, there's, it's, it's an area of, of mystery and, uh, and yet intense concern. And as you get older, this concern magnifies. Or if you're in an area of, of great danger, such as a, a wartime and so on, then you th think about it a little more. And of course, some people think that uh, death is the end of everything. It's a kind of annihilation. I'm not specifically interested in defending any position, but in but in, in trying to evaluate one of the answers, and, uh, or two of them especially, and, uh, and, and this, uh, in case this might be of interest to somebody besides myself. Um, first of all, uh, one of the theories uh, that is very popular today is the theory of reincarnation. And this comes to us from the East, especially the Hindu tradition, also shared by the Buddhists and other Eastern religions. And, and, the, and it's the idea that, that is based on, on the fact that the spiritual journey is a long trip and, and that it seems to be very hard to negotiate the whole journey into higher states of consciousness in one lifetime. After all, uh, at the time that incarnation was uh, evolved as a theory, people, average life of people was probably around 40 to 45. Uh, certainly at the time of, of Christ, most people didn't live beyond that time. And some statistics indicate that most children uh, who were born, uh, at least half of them were dead by the age of 16. And, and uh, an enormous number of infants died before they were five. So what happens to these uh, souls if you, if you acknowledge that there is a principle of ongoing life and an, and an imperishable quality to the, the human organism? Reincarnation is gathering popularity in the West partially because of the interaction of different literatures and the revelation of aspects of the Hindu and Buddhist traditions that had never been generally well known. And uh, I think we have to accept the fact that uh, this very widespread, perhaps half of the religious people uh, in the world believe this. And they believe it because they're aware that at the moment of death, most people don't seem to be ready to enter fully into the final light or love or, 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 or the degree of, of, of perfection that we project, at least, is required to enter into eternal life, as it's called in the Christian tradition, or, or uh, nirvana in the Buddhist tradition, or uh, bliss in the Hindu tradition, and so on. So uh, this is a, a fact that hasn't escaped any, any religion. In other words, for all of the rituals and all of the activities and all the generosity of, 
of religious practitioners, there this, this still remains an, a, a good deal of the ego, or false self-activity, still mingled with religious practices and even spiritual attainment. And, and one wonders, how is this uh, removed or how is this purified so that these so that people can enter into the fullness of God in, in whom there is no shadow of imperfection, according to some uh, theologies. So, so it makes sense uh, uh, and, uh, to figure out what happens, but the uh, principle to keep in mind here is almost every religious person agrees that life seems to be too short to negotiate the whole process from beginning to end. And indeed, in the East, uh, the thought is that one may have thousands or hundreds of thousands of lives to repeat, each one uh, resulting through the principle of karma into a new kind of of, uh, of existence in this life. Karma is a marvelous insight into the human condition, and, and it's reflected in the sub-Western uh, religious thinking, too. It's, it's that every cause produces an effect. And so, depending on how we live in this life, then when the, the next life comes and one reincarnates, that uh, reincarnation reflects the state of progress or lack of progress that one has made in, in the previous incarnation. Now, the, the, the idea of in reincarnation is fairly diffuse. It's not the same in all the traditions. And it's, uh, some people even think one can be reincarnated as animals. Uh, the whole of life is, is, is in this idea, uh, inter, uh, interdependent and interconnected and everything that we do has an effect, and it will be reflected in our next life, and then the next life, and the next life, till finally, after thousands and thousands of years, one finally emerges into, into the final entrance into the light. Um, well, uh, how long uh, uh, a span are we talking about here of human existence? Well keeps moving back, and maybe it's uh, as much as 100,000 or 150,000 years, which is quite a little time for lifetimes to emerge. So, so the theory has a great, great attraction for many people. It also seems to me to have a, a certain cultural uh, congeniality with the Eastern uh, traditions. And, and we, we shouldn't underestimate cultural factors in, in religious practices. Um, for instance, the, in, in the East, their, their life experiences has kept them very close to nature, which has a cyclical view of time, night and day, uh, summer and winter, life and death. Uh, the recycling of the seasons that enables the fertility and, uh, and, and, and the healing of the earth and the uh, time when the crops are, are not coming up or the earth is resting. Um, and, 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 and life itself seems to be circular. So, so there's, there's the, the natural tendency would be to conceive of time or to project our mental image of time as something that constantly recurs, constantly repeats itself, because this is what nature seems to be doing. In, in the West, this uh, concept was interrupted by the uh, Judeo-Christian revelation, which began to talk about life in a linear sense. That is to say, time was going someplace. There was end time. There was a judgment. There was an end to everything. And, and since this uh, new view of life uh, has, has been, uh, been around now for uh, three or 4,000 years, it has affected uh, uh, the Western world to a very deep degree where Christianity at least developed in a great way uh, in, in, uh, in the last millennium or two. So, so we think of time then, uh, if we're from the West, 
as, 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 as something that progresses and that develops. In the East, they deal with development in, in a circular way, that, that uh, over many thousands of years, uh, the reincarnation is, uh, is repeated and repeated. But in, in the view of some of these uh, teachers, it, it gets worse as time goes on. And every now and then, you have to start over. And there's some catastrophe. And then, then uh, uh, God, or, or their particular term for God would be Brahman, I guess. Uh, send some great reformer into the situation in order to renew the spiritual tradition and, and to renew the cycle and to renew the possibilities then of, of the uh, human family of moving towards its ultimate destiny, which always seems to be uh, this union or unity with God. That seems to be a common factor in them all. So, uh, so Everyone agrees there's a problem. Okay. How do you explain how people, uh, what becomes of people who are not quite ready uh, and some who are obviously you know, not ready? Uh, what's going to happen to them when they depart this life? So in the, in the view of those who view life as terming, uh, ter terminating in a, in a general judgment, then uh, you can see why out of this concept would come a, a specific idea of, of heaven as a reward for those who achieved this uh, purity of, of uh, heart and of love, and that hell would be where those go who have not uh, uh, any chance of, uh, of, ch of changing after the present life is over. Now, the Roman Catholics conceived uh, another idea, and that is the idea of purgatory, of continuing the purification, but not by returning to this world and going through the whole of life again, but rather of, uh, of reincarnating, so to speak, in purgatory with some kind of spiritual body or, or, or presence that would enable the work of purification of the unconscious to go on. If you have seen my tapes, the process of the purification of the unconscious, or the divine therapy, as I've called it, uh, culminates in the night of spirit, a term John of the Cross invented, to describe the, uh, the ultimate purification of the depths of the soul that leads to divine union even in this life. And he says that this is the equivalent of purgatory. In other words, purgatory is simply a dreadful necessity for those who didn't go through the night of spirit in this world, who didn't accept the full purifying effects of the divine therapy. And so he goes so far as to say that those who've been through the night of spirit will not go through purgatory. So you can see there's a very strong difference of emphasis in, in, in at least in, in John of the Cross as a spokesman for the Christian tradition. And the, the many, uh, the long-standing uh, Hindu and Buddhist teaching that no one, virtually no one, is able to complete the journey in this life, although the great spiritual masters recommend it highly. So the ideal is to achieve nirvana in one lifetime. But the implication is it's not going to happen to too many people. So uh, the, uh, whatever one's view is, if one really is making progress, it, it seems that uh, at the time of death, it really isn't going to make too much difference to you anyway, because you, uh, you will be disposed to accept whatever happens. And so if it does mean reincarnation, fine. If it doesn't, fine. So, so uh, people uh, in the Zen Buddhist tradition, for instance, believe in reincarnation but don't make much of it or don't like to discuss it too much because that's not their issue. Their issue is getting as far as you can in this world and not to engage in the theoretical uh, considerations about things that you don't know much about anyway. Um, 
in the context of uh, this presentation, it might be helpful to add what some of the evidence is for both theories, uh, or both belief systems. And, and, and since both are so general and are well established, they, they certainly deserve our, our respect and understanding. And uh, I think we could do well to dialogue a little bit uh, with each other more on this subject to be sure we understand exactly what the different forms of reincarnation really are and what they're saying. And they might be helped by understanding profoundly what we are saying. Uh, we might even find that both may be true. I mean, uh, or in a certain sense are true. Remember, these are, are fairly literal uh, explanations for a very concrete fact namely that people die without seeming to be quite ready to enter into their glory. Uh, and, and yet uh, they, they need to, uh, to talk to each other uh, about these issues and perhaps uh, in that view, in that light, to modify in some way the different considerations that could then be of, of, of some use to the people who who belong to these various traditions. But uh, in modern times, there are some interesting uh, uh, witnesses have evolved, uh, uh, as well as in older times. For instance, in the Christian tradition, we have quite a bit of evidence that from reasonable people, that people who have gone on before and entered into the glory of heaven have, have appeared to various people to cure them or to give them a message or to, or to uh, and that these visions can sometimes be very profound and sometimes can be sensible. And the apparitions of the Blessed Mother are certainly uh, uh, quite numerous in, in our times. Uh, and, and so this uh, evidence that people who have died uh, do appear occasionally to people still on earth for good purposes and, and to help them out. Well, we could answer this issue by saying, well, these are the very people who have entered into the final glory, so this is not a problem exactly. The problem begins to get more uh, confusing or at least uh, intricate when, when we consider the, the uh, evidence of uh, of ghosts, for instance, and and there's a pretty uh, almost, there's almost no doubt that these disembodied spirits, or some of them, tend to hang out in places where they were familiar with in early in early years, or to which they may be attracted by the magnetism of of emotional uh, uh, attractions. Uh, just to mention a few things uh, along this line, just for the sake of gathering data. Uh, you, you've heard, of course, of the near-death experiences, which uh, some writers or researchers have gathered. And at this point, there, there are thousands of witnesses that, who had a near-death experience, which they describe rather fully, uh, but consistently, as as being drawn through this tunnel towards a light, and that this light is, uh, is, is, is very attractive. And when they get to the end, there's a certain delight. And then they are thrust back into the tunnel and come back to Earth and wake up. So the presumption is, if, that, if, they, if this is death, this, this, is, uh, this is wonderful. I mean, why delay it? <laughs> On the other hand, there are some examples when it was not a pleasant experience, and that some people experienced only 1% of the evidence, according to one researcher that I read, uh, where they experienced the kind of, of, of agony or desolation or loneliness that closely resembles St. John of the Cross's uh, description of some of the states of that one passes through in the night of spirit. So uh, evidently, uh, sometimes this near-death experience, near experience this is a preview of death, 
uh, but it cannot be. And whether this means that the people who have a near-death experience didn't just go the full way down the tunnel, or they didn't, uh, uh, they're in another state of mind which could then uh, uh, lead to some kind of, uh, of judgment. The light seems to be the natural light of, uh, of our own spirit as the image of God uh, uh, for the first time being able to reveal itself and ourselves to it so that uh, the, la the judgment that is made about uh, our lives is not based on something outside ourselves but is, is the clear interior and hence irrefutable evidence of what our own inner light has witnessed of our conduct for good or not so good. And that, so that what happens after that still remains the mystery, so that one could then decide that, uh, or, or the decision is made for you by seeing the facts that it's not yet time to go into the full light, and hence, presumably, the spirit would, would uh, go to what Roman Catholics call purgatory to complete its purification, or if the other, uh, other, uh, theory of reincarnation uh, is, is, uh, is valid, then they would uh, begin to accept the fact that they must go through another uh, evolution or period of, of trial in, uh, in another lifetime, which would correspond in general to the actions that, they, uh, that had been done or not done in the, pre in the previous lifetime. Thus, karma is, a, is a, as a theory, is a very significant part of this, uh, uh, of the whole question of life after death and of reincarnation and so on. I've met people, and uh, now two people, maybe that's not people in general, but uh, uh, who, who uh, as a therapeutic practice, uh, discovered that some people are obsessed by a disembodied spirit that is in, in no way to be associated with a demon in the traditional sense of that word, but is simply a spirit that seems to uh, latch on to this person for whatever reason we don't quite know. And, and the therapy consists of putting them or someone else into a deep state of hypnosis, and the therapist then speaks to this disembodied spirit who uses the voice box of, of the one who is hypnotized to, uh, to converse with the therapist. And the, the therapy consists of trying to persuade this voice uh, that represents the spirit to let go of its dwelling in or upon this other person and to uh, just uh, depart for the light. And sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. But the, the therapy never accuses the disembodied spirit of any evil or any fault. It's simply a question of counseling. You'll be so much happier in the next life. Your departed relatives are waiting for you and that sort of thing. Well, there's a whole series of cases that were brought together in which this therapy was practiced. So, so so the question is, who are these people who can't seem to, who haven't even begun to go through the light to, uh, that is described by uh, other evidence of people who experience the, the uh, uh, preview of death experience, near death experience as it's called. I also met another gentleman at a workshop of, of, that wasn't on this subject, but it, he, he just happened to be chatting with me. And, and he engaged in, in, in uh, psychotherapy with the deceased. Well, my first reaction to this would be, this is kind of dangerous, my friend, and uh, it might be just as well to stay away from it because uh, because sometimes uh, there is evidence of evil spirits, that is to say, very evil spirits who also 
uh, influence uh, ordinary people at times. And, and so this business of engaging with conversation with the deceased has always been looked upon as, as rather dangerous for, for people unless they're very highly qualified and exorcists who try to help people be free of, of negative influences that we call demons are, uh, are very carefully selected and chosen. And uh, there's some reference to them, of course, in Scripture. But here we're talking about someone who died uh, and, uh, and, and who, who never resolved a family problem. And uh, I didn't have a chance to find out from this guy how he got in contact with these departed spirits. But, but he, he would try to mediate, uh, not so much by talking with the living party, but with the deceased, to, to help that person to forgive or to be reconciled with this person and, and, uh, and, uh, and to try to resolve the conflict. So, so, so this uh, sort of reminds us that whatever unfinished business of a serious emotional character that we take with us into the death process may follow us into the next life. And, and, uh, if we're not too far advanced in the spiritual journey, we, we, we could be helped by someone else who could bring to our attention what dispositions are necessary to be free of our fascination for, for the particular problem we were involved with and to free us up to go into the light. In, in any case, we're talking about several different levels of departed spirits. Uh, one who hasn't, uh, several who haven't even started into the light, and several who did and didn't finish it, and those who did uh, still leaves the open question of what becomes of them after the light, which is probably their own inner spirit, according to some researchers on this subject, once they have seen uh, that they're not ready for the light, then they freely choose whatever necessar is necessary for purification. And then, so that doesn't in any way help us resolve the issue of, of whether that choice is reincarnation or purification or whether both choices are available. As, 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 just as a matter of information, I think many of the Protestant denominations never accepted the doctrine of purgatory because it was developed some couple of centuries after the death of Christ, and it, uh, uh, they chose not to, uh, uh, to bring that doctrine with them when they departed from the uh, Roman Catholic communion. So uh, we spoke about the evidence of some departed people being rather close to the earth or to the people they loved or the people they hated for a certain period after we would have expected them to have moved on to their glory or their purification, as the case might be. But there is the other phenomenon of ghosts that I mentioned casually, and that is that that uh, some people seem to stay a long time in the place or the house or the area where they lived. And uh, just what the diagnosis is for this is we don't fully know. All we know is that it happened. And I've uh, met uh, this, this, this why uh, some places, some houses are known for their ghosts. <laughs> They're hard to rent. Uh, and, and there's no doubt that there have been manifestations of something happening. Now, some people are inclined to attribute all this to demons, but in the light of the evidence of, of people who, who obsess certain others and make life more miserable for them by adding their emotional problems to the poor person that they're inhabiting, uh, they're not bad people. They're not demons. They're just people in the human condition with non-complete uh, problems of, of purification, in other words, with egos that won't let go. And, and so the, the ghost, apparently, is someone 
who, who hangs out in a place and sometimes doesn't want other people to join them or, or they, they just have, are manifesting certain qualities. Um, but they manifest themselves usually by walking around upstairs or by opening doors when there's nobody there and things like that. Uh, I especially think of a monk I knew who was a hermit who lived in a very isolated place that was almost, oh no, because of the snow, almost no approach in winter. And uh, here he was all alone in the midst of nowhere. And, and, and when he was uh, sitting in his uh, prayer room, sometimes the door would open. Sometimes he'd hear somebody walking. And uh, he was a pretty uh, uh, courageous fellow, so he didn't pay much attention to it. But when the uh, doors would open, when he was trying to say mass, then he began to think that the, uh, maybe there's some remedy for this. So the, the, the inspiration came to him to offer the mass for this person, whoever it was. And he had found out that the previous owner had, had died under some difficult circumstances. I don't know what these were. But as soon as he has offered prayers for this person, the problem ceased. And, and so it, 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 it's not just a Christian idea to pray for the dead. As you know, the Tibetan monks and their whole uh, teaching on the bardo has been printed in recent books and is well known. Uh, they project a 30 to 40 day, I believe it is, I forget which, period in which the departed goes through various stages of, of connecting with the light, of wanting to stay in the light, and then beginning to feel some attraction, notice from the depths of the unconscious, for certain attachments it had on earth. And these begin uh, to get stronger because they weren't purified during the time of life on earth. And finally, it decides to return to earth uh, as a way of continuing its purification. Some, some even say you can choose your parents if this is true, I think some people uh, need some instruction into how to choose that. <laughs> they certainly wound up in some uh, pretty poor circumstances, some of them. But anyway, that's, that's the theory. And uh, uh, this, this monk uh, had a sense, a deeper sense from that time on of what in the Christian uh, terminology is called the communion of saints, which I don't think is well understood, and, and perhaps unless one has a concrete experience of, of, one's, uh, of one's connection with the departed or with other people around the world and so on, it, it doesn't dawn on us. And, and this is the work of some of the contemplative gifts. Gift of understanding, for instance, gives people a, a penetrating understanding through an experience or taste of, of, uh, of the next world or of people in the next world or so on. And the realization that the human family is, is, has a certain oneness uh, that, that uh, reduces the past, the present, and the future to a certain unity, a commonality of source, and a certain mutual accountability so that in some way we we can, uh, we can help or be helped by everybody on earth. So th this is what we mean by communion, a certain goodwill towards everyone and an openness to receiving help from everyone that, of course, is not uh, experienced by those who are at enmity with different groups or prejudices or biases and so on. And these are all parts of the, of the uh, uh, harm which over-identification with a group can, can produce. So uh, we've, uh, we've spoken then of the fact that, uh, that these, the theory of purgatory and of reincarnation seems to uh, leave out what happens to people who are in an in-between state. Uh, the, the Tibetan teaching seems to recognize it, but it limits it to 40 days, whereas we know that some ghosts haunt houses, at least in our time, for years and years and years. And, and, uh, and at the same time, does that mean that when they finally depart from, uh, 
place that they were attached to or the person they were attached to, does that mean that they're just beginning the journey into the light that others have, uh, have said that they experienced even in this life, a near-death experience? We just don't know the answers, of course, to those questions. But the, the value of both theories, I think, uh, is, is significant for our view of the after-death experience that awaits all of us. The only thing that I, I would suggest here, and this is just a hypothesis, is, uh, is based on some other evidence that has recently uh, begun to accumulate. And maybe it hasn't gone far, far enough to really take seriously yet. But uh, we know from the experience of people who indulged in psychedelic drugs that their experience of, of altered states of consciousness introduced them to a world that was sometimes fantastic beyond this world and opened them up to categories of, of suffering, sometimes to blissful experience, but also to what they called bad trips in which they had all. Uh, nightmarish experiences of suffering and, and that they had no control over. It was as if they were immersed in a world in which uh, a whole new dimension of collective suffering was involved. Um, after that was uh, LSD was forbidden, uh, some researchers engaged in what is called holotropic breathing and if you, there are even workshops on this subject, but a workshop is generally fairly limited and one is normally recommended not to do it privately. It's an extremely powerful method of, of opening one's consciousness to whatever, certainly to go beyond the normal confines of our consciousness. And uh, in, uh, in a, a book by a researcher who had practiced this form of, of uh, treatment over many years and, uh, and had a great deal of experience of various states, including the ecstatic states that he apparently went through after these negative ones occurred, uh, we find a, uh, we find that he, he experienced uh, enormous suffering of the could only be called the, the collective passion, so to speak, or suffering of, of humanity as a whole. In other words, he, he felt immersed in, in, in the sufferings of great wars, of, of great oppression, of great starvation, of droughts, of uh, all kinds of human suffering, oppression. And, and, and he experienced it not as so much as his own, but as being immersed in a reality that was greater than himself, but just as real in himself, and to which he had a certain uh, uh, responsibility in being a part of the human family as a whole. And uh, in, reading, in reading the story of his experience, uh, I don't know that it was his intention, but the, the conclusion that, uh, that uh, awakened in me, so to speak, was that this, that th this suggested uh, or reinforced some of the psychological theories of recent times that, that speak not just of the psychological unconscious, but also of the uh, collective unconscious. Uh, and that uh, sort of reminds us uh, that, that, that reincarnation adds to our ordinary consciousness uh, implicitly all the other consciousness that we had in all the other lifetimes that we allegedly passed through. And there, is, there are therapies today that help you remember your past lives. My question is, are you really remembering your past life 
How do you know it wasn't somebody else's? And uh, now that we have modern inventions about uh, tape and videotape, uh, uh, maybe the universe or nature has a way in which everybody's experience is, is retained and is somewhere in the atmosphere and that some people, especially with certain psychic gifts, have intuitive faculties that are more attuned to this material and sometimes recognize as, as their own experience, uh, because it's so intense, something that actually uh, happened uh, uh, to somebody else. But naturally, they attribute it to themselves because it's so intense and they think they are recovering a past life. Of course, there's a certain amount of, of uh, razzmatazz in, in everything, I suppose, and, and it does make one a little skeptical about past lives when an, an, a, an a significant number of people all think they formerly were Mary Magdalene or Abraham Lincoln or the same guy. I mean, it, 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 it's a little improbable. So, but there, are some seri there is some serious evidence that makes you think, for instance, I met a woman who had no interest or belief at all in reincarnation, but who, who in, 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 in deep massage and, and, and in a therapeutic situation, uh, described this, this pain she'd had all her life in her side. And during the deep massage, a memory occurred in which she recognized intuitively and without any doubt that in a previous lifetime she had been killed by a knife wound. Well, as, 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 as soon as she recognized this, this wound disappeared. She never had it again. Well, that's pretty hard to explain, especially when she had at the same time a, a interior conviction that that's how she had died, and she was simply remembering her past life. Uh, well, what do you do with that? <laughs> I still am not convinced because it seems to me that if, if, if it's true that uh, when all uh, in an altered state of consciousness that one is more aware of one's unity with everybody else's suffering or, or life or joys for that matter, then, then even though an incident like that is, is so powerful and strong, it, it, it nonetheless uh, is nece not necessarily our experience. We could be drawing on the, the, the collective pain of the history of humanity as a whole and not just our ancestral line. And so uh, this suggests to me that, that reincarnation is a wonderful explanation in so far as it goes for, for the uh, resolution of karmic difficulties and the obvious fact that people are not always ready for death. But it doesn't go far enough. That is to say, it puts us in, in, in a, 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 a relationship of, of dependence with all our ancestors and with all our previous lives. Perhaps this is why ancestral worship is, is one of the uh, religious expressions of the world, that people sense that they've inherited things, not just bodies, but, but attitudes and genetic qualities from their ancestors. But, but of course, reincarnation goes farther and says that you, you, uh, you're really experiencing your own life, not just your ancestors' uh, past life. But what this evidence suggests of, 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 of the collective suffering of humanity uh, appearing in consciousness in certain altered states, uh, perhaps this is, a, is, is an insight into what in the Christian tradition we call the communion of saints, only we don't understand what it means. It's very congenial to the whole idea of the incarnation and redemption in which we understand Christ to have so identified with the human family as a whole and with each individual that, that the whole uh, melodrama of our lives with our angst and pain and anguish has somehow been taken into, into Christ's consciousness and uh, was kind of 
congealed in, in that cup that he was asked to drink, that is, to identify uh, his own consciousness with the deepest levels of human agony, desperation, rejection, panic, loss, discouragement, fear, and all, all the other intensely afflictive emotions that occur as a result of great suffering or as the consequence of, of the human condition and of our personal ratification of uh, the kind of evil that disregards the rights and needs of others and our own true good in order to get what we want or to get away from what we don't want. And, 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 and further, we know from the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ that St. Paul lays out in such detail, that we are not just uh, isolated beings, but in virtue of baptism and the desire of baptism and of grace, we are somehow, mysteriously indeed, but really uh, part of, of a larger or collective body of Christ in which uh, the Spirit of God dwells and in which the, there is interaction between all the cells for the good of the whole body. So that perhaps we don't understand how closely the human species is knit together. Even though Jesus suggests this in his uh, description of the Last Judgment in which he says, I was sick and you visited me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was in prison and you visited me. That means we visited in any one of the people that we do good to, we are actually touching and visiting and in communion with Jesus, the universal person, so to speak, the Christ who dwells in every member of the human family, but is, is uh, by revelation present as, as, the, as, the, as the spirit or heart of, of everyone uh, who belongs to the uh, mystical body of Christ. So that this idea of our oneness is, is very congenial to the, the Christian tradition. And it's also, interestingly, a very near and dear to some of the Buddhist traditions. In the Buddha, one of the Buddhist traditions, there is the teaching of the Bodhisattva, which is a person who has completed the divine therapy, so to speak, and has entered into, uh, about to enter into the fullness of glory, but who refuses to do so in order to return another reincarnation, in order to serve the needs, and who who will not enter into final glory until everybody else has gone in there first. Uh, now this, this is certainly an, an enormous insight into divine love and, uh, and uh, a teaching that is, uh, that's, that's very close to what Christians understand Christ has actually done. Uh, few distinctions maybe, but the basic idea is the, the total sacrifice of oneself for the good of the whole species. And, and, and so uh, we come now to the crucial question, which Ken Wilbur has raised in an article in, in I think the second or third volume of his collected works, which is, well, if you believe in reincarnation, what transmigrates? And, and uh, according to the more developed teaching about reincarnation, it's not the personality. So that's why we don't remember anything from a past life and, unless there's some special circumstances that bring something back. As I've already said, maybe what is brought back is something from the reservoir of human memory that exists someplace that we don't understand yet, but which is sort of manifested by the various means we maintain now, what people have said or what they look like uh, for generations. Uh, modern medicine has, has added a, another little 
uh, inside here, it says, uh, at least some of them are saying, that every experience we ever had in the body is recorded somewhere in the nervous system or the brain, so that you could have a rerun of, of uh, even your subconscious experiences, or even your, the things that happened when you were asleep, if you want to. I don't know why you would, but anyway, there's, there's no getting away from reality or from what has happened. It's how you deal with it, apparently, that is essential. And, and, uh, and, and once we have passed through, in some degree, the purification that the divine therapy is, has initiated and invited us into, and which then will, will lead us to the point where we can enter immediately into the divine light and the fullness of glory upon death without these intermediary states that some of us seem to be afflicted with, or whether that's what is meant by purgatory, uh, I don't know. We don't know. But this, this much uh, recommends itself to our, uh, our serious consideration. And, and that is that when our own purification is somewhat complete, there remains everybody else's to deal with. So that there is the collective purification that is inevitable as part of our own, that belongs to us in virtue of being a human being. That's the way it is. <laughs> and, and, and so being joined with Christ uh, provides us with the strength and the inspiration and the need to understand how to do this. But obviously, this is the ultimate love, to be ready to give up love itself, that is, all the consequences of divine love and the delight of a purified conscience and the rewards of heaven itself in, in order to, uh, by returning into the difficulties and maelstrom of this world, to enable others, depending on what God is, in, what participation God has invited us to experience in His own passion and death, as Paul says, I fill up in my own body what is wanting to the sufferings of Christ. And what is wanting to the sufferings of Christ, this, this is our share in virtue of being one human being in the same species that he is in, that, that uh, invites us to uh, bear the sufferings of others, or, to, or by suffering, to free others from the bonds of, uh, of the false self-system from which they cannot free themselves. And so, to give up love for love's sake is perhaps the greatest expression of love. And it's, it, it, it explains how, in the Christian mystical <laughs> tradition, there are many examples of which people who were, had reached the transforming union returned again to a vicarious night of spirit in which they experienced the deepest or deeper trials and purifications and, and desolation and dryness and anguish, and, and not now for themselves, but in the spirit of the bodhisattva and, of, and above all in the spirit of Christ that they endured for others. Hence, perhaps, the greatest of all manifestations of divine love is, is to share in the, in the vocation of Christ's redemptive activity, which is to bear the sufferings of others. Now, the next question is, are they really others? In other words, is, uh, should we even distinguish the suffering we have as others? Or, or should we rather see that 
that the collective suffering of humanity is, is normal, is a normal experience for us all, and that our own experience of suffering is, is not as important as in sharing that common endeavor, that cosmic suffering, you might say, which seems to lead us, lead humanity into the experience of resurrection. Resurrection in the sense of the inner transformation into the mind and heart of Christ. So our work is not finished then fully until everyone else is in that place too. That doesn't mean we have to be reincarnated again and again. Perhaps if one reaches the holiness of heaven, one can do it from there. Again, we don't know the answers to this question. There's only the evidence that some of the saints seem to be doing this in their ministries after death, like St. Therese of Lisieux, who's recently a doctor of the church. So the bottom line of all this, then, is that reincarnation as a theory invites us to look beyond that to the oneness of the human family in which everybody's lifetime, in a sense, is ours, and ours is theirs. And that uh, in, in this oneness, uh, everybody shares the same source, the same struggles, the same love, and has the destiny of becoming one with God. Thank you.